Hello, welcome. In this video, as you can tell from my largely written title here, we're talking about exponential functions. And hopefully I can convince you that they're awesome. Now, the first thing we should probably talk about with exponential functions is a reminder of what they're all about. And when you hear that phrase, exponential function, I hope right away you have a picture in your mind, either of an equation or a graph. So let's just do that real quick. Actually, let's pull up some graph paper. So I've got my back black um, blackboard here because I miss writing on the blackboard. So anyway, it reminds me of it. I think I got this, this digital chalk. But anyway, uh, that being said, let's graph this thing. Okay, so I want to do a precise graph, but you know, when you hear about exponential functions, you should have a rough picture of this in your mind, what I'm about to show you. Okay, so I'll draw my x-axis and y-axis. Perhaps the first thing that comes to mind for me, the parent function of all exponential functions is f of x to the 2x. So f of x to the 2x. So let's just label that. Let's say this is our parent function, right? This is the parent function. And the reason it's the parent function is because it involves doubling and halving, which is probably the easiest for our brains. So let's let's just analyze, let's see how that kind of plays out here. So if we have the parent function two to the x, what does that mean? Well, we're gonna plug in a couple of things here. Plug in zero, we get one, right? Two to the zero is one. Plug in one, we get two, two, we get four, and so on and so forth. Three, we get eight, right? Make sure you're comfortable that two to the zero is one. If you're not, let me know. I've got lots of resources for that. But suffice to say, any positive number to the zero power is one. So we're gonna be dealing with this point zero one a lot. As we go to the right here, you can see this doubling happening. That's the curvature of exponential growth, okay? As we go to the left, though, we're dealing with negative exponents, and that's division, right? Two to the negative one is one half. Two to the negative two is one fourth. And we're always having, as we move in this direction here, now, the way I drew it, I'm trying to be as precise as possible, we've got an asymptote at y equals zero. Right? So a couple of things are happening right away. We can tell with an exponential function, with the parent function two to the x, we can tell that we're, we're gonna have an asymptote. So it's asymptotic, asymptotic at y equals zero. So that's a way of saying it approaches the x-axis but never reaches it. We can see that smooth, continuous nature of the function. We can see that it kind of starts off with a really slow climb, right? And then it starts to skyrocket at some point in its, in, its, in its life, I guess we could say. Now, those are all the basic properties. For In order for those properties to exist, we have to think about not just the specific parent function, but in general, um, what we're dealing with with these kind of functions. So we're dealing with exponential functions where we have some value of base. So our base is A. I, I would call it B, but the resource we use right now use A, so I'll stick with that, to some variable exponent. And the variable exponent is kind of the telltale sign that we are dealing with exponential functions. Now, for an exponential function to exhibit the properties that we really like, we say a couple of things about it. So let's just do that. So here's our exponential function. We've got a base, it's got an exponent. We say that the base can't equal one because if it did, then it would be just a flat line at one. We also say it can't equal zero and it can't be negative. So it should be greater than zero. And that's simply because if you plug in zero for a base, you have to deal with zero to the zero. And I don't even know what that equals, right? We, I should say, I don't know um, that I want to explain the different perspectives on what this equals. And we don't want to deal with negative bases because that gets really interesting, but not very useful. Um, so for example, if, if A equals negative two, then I'll just say chaos. It gets crazy. So um, how, how, how come? Well, let's just look at what we know about negative numbers and exponents. So if we say, if f of x equals negative two to the x, so it's just like our parent function, only instead of two as the base, we have negative two uh, as a base, then, well, what happens? 
If we plug in zero, we have negative two to the zero, our output's one. Plug in one, the output's negative two, right? Two to negative two to the one is two, negative two. If we plug in two, negative two squared is four, and right away we notice, oh, look at that. We started off with a positive output, then a negative, then a positive. It's jumping all over the place, right? But what about if we said, okay, let's we can graph that bouncing back and forth. A little rough sketch, right? We got this. We can do this. Zero, one, one, negative two, two, four. Right? The question becomes, where is the next point and what's happening in between? So the in-between this is particularly difficult. So for example, if I plug in 0.5, that's the square root. And the square root of negative two is just i times the square root of two. So that's not even on the plane, it's a whole. Oh boy. But then I can look at like let's say 0 0.51. All right. Well, okay, 0 0.51, what is that as an output? That's rather hard to analyze. And I could always then squeeze in another number, 0 0.501, right? I could always squeeze in something between any two numbers I give you. So because there's this weird bouncing around nature, how do I even model that on a graph, right? That kind of bouncing, that movement. And that's why we kind of make sure that our bases aren't negative, a little too difficult to analyze. But if we go back to our graph, if our base is positive, we can also say um, another common thing that happens is that everything we're dealing with will typically cross 0, 1, as long as we don't transform it by sliding it or reflecting it over the x-axis. So what does that look like? Well, if I say I have f of x equals uh, 1 half, that's positive, right, to the x. Well, one half to the x, I just think as we go to the right, we're having essentially. We we still start at one because one half to the zero is one. But then you plug in one, you get a half. Two, you get a fourth, right? Three, you get an eighth. It's still asymptotic with respect to y equals zero. But as you will go backwards, the opposite essentially happens that did before. Instead of decreasing in value, it's going to increase. It's going to go up. And in fact, it'll go up to exactly the heights of two to the x just on the other side of the y-axis. So it's clearly a reflection on the y-axis. And we'll look at that in a second. All right, you see those same heights there. But we can also demonstrate that by looking at the arithmetic. So for example, to get this point right here, think about what we have to do. We plug in a negative one, right? So that just means we're looking at one half to the negative one as our output. And that just means Right, the negative one power is the reciprocal of whatever your base is. So it's just negative one, and the reciprocal of one half is two, hence the point. Here, if we plug in a negative three, negative one, and then a negative two, excuse me, and then we're looking at one half to the negative two, well, now we're looking at the reciprocal of one half squared, and that's just two squared or four. So negative two gives us a four right here. But how could we have predicted that it would be a reflection? Well, if you remember for a transformation to be a reflection, right? let's say we have uh, y equals f of negative x, this thing will be a reflection of f of x over the y-axis because we're taking the opposite of the inputs. Are we doing that here? The answer is yes. And you can tell by messing around with the exponents. Right here, 1 half is the same thing as 2 to the negative 1. And that's being raised to the x power. But we know that right here, if you multiply those two exponents, we get 2 to the negative x. And there you can see, look at that, it's really cool, right? Instead of an x, we have a negative x, right? These, the parent function over here and this function, the inputs are the opposite. So they are reflections over the line, over the vertical axis, the y axis. Um, if you want to reflect it over the x axis, right, you could bring it down, let's say, by doing f of x equals negative 2 to the x. And this, careful, that's not negative 2 to the power of x. It's essentially saying negative 1 times 2 to the x. So that this function is equal to the opposite of the original function. You could say, in this case, y equals the opposite of our original f of x. So it's a reflection over the x-axis. Now, I do want to show you applications of exponents, but I'll show you that in the next video. And what we'll do is we'll primarily talk about compound interest, 
one of the central things that are often discussed when looking at exponential functions. All right, thanks.